Hello, and welcome to Pop Culture Graveyard. I'm your host, Hollis. And today I'm going to talk about David Bowie. We're going to do a bit of a deep dive from 1967 all the way up through 1980. That's my Bowie. Who's your Bowie? There are a lot of Bowies. I'm not going to be talking about from 1983's Let's Dance all the way up through 2016's Black Star. I'll let somebody else take you there. I'm just going to concentrate on those years, the 14-year run of amazing music. But Hollis, can't you talk about, like, you know, official live stuff that's really awesome? Yeah, I could. I could get into that. But I'm not going to because I want to concentrate on the studio albums because they're so good. But there's unofficial bootlegs. Do you want to talk about some of them? Some of them are really great. I do, but I don't have enough time. I think this will clock in at somewhere around 17 hours, give or take. Might, might be 30, might be closer to 30. Um, but I'm gonna stay away from the live stuff. Comps, yeah, there are some good comps out there. Changes one and changes two, you know, if you, if you like early Bowie from what you hear today, um, but you know, you think that you only need a couple of comps, those are the ones to get. There's other ones, there's Best of Bowie, there's Sound and Vision box set, there's Bowie Rare, there's all kinds of Bowie stuff out there. So find out which is your Bowie and go with that Bowie. Now on with my Bowie. Oh, and before we get to that, if you want to click on the description below, check out the links that I'm offering. Uh, I'm not going to send you to any bad vinyl pressings. I make sure that they're all good pressings, very well reviewed. Some of them I have myself. So if you want music, check out the description below. Also, if you just want to see what I'm going to talk about, it's all in the description below. So I won't be mad at you. Let the video play, pop down, see what's going on, come back. Uh, just hit that subscribe button and maybe give me a like. I don't know. Likes are good, I hear. So David Bowie, back when he's a mod, 66, 67. He's in all kinds of bands. He was in a jazz band, the Conrads. He played saxophone. He started playing R&B with other mods, the Manish Boys, Davy Jones and the Lower Third. He had a band called Davy Jones and the King Bees. Um, and he was, you know, very much like every other mod back then. Even Mark Bolin before he formed T-Rex. He had a couple of mod bands he was in playing R&B. Um, he changed his name from Davy Jones to David Bowie. Uh, for many reasons. Um, one, he just liked the name Bowie, um, named after Jim Bowie, the knife. He said it cuts both ways, that name, so he liked it for that reason. But uh, he also changed it because Davy Jones of the Monkees was getting very popular in the, the mid-60s, and he's British as well, so he really didn't want that confusion. So he signed with the Derham label, uh, this is an album, a double album called Images, that has all of his Derham label stuff. I could have shown the 67 album, but it, it, this also has all the singles he put out on Durham, some of which are really worth having. Um, there's songs like Sell Me a Coat, which is a great song, uh, which you could almost imagine being in a Wes Anderson film. It's got that kind of sound to it. Uh, it's got um, Love You Till Tuesday. Um, there are some songs on here, The Laughing Gnome, which could only happen in the 60s. Uh, Rubber Band is a fantastic early song. Um, somewhat like the music that Cat Stevens was putting out at the time before he got so introspective and got into the folk thing. He was doing more of a pop sensibility for young girls um, and he was backed by an orchestra in some cases. If you hear Bowie's voice on this, he's still trying to find his voice. Um, I want you to look up on YouTube Anthony Newley, if you don't know the name. Uh, he's got all kinds of songs like Which Way Can I Turn or um, who, forget the other name, the other songs he had. But if you look up Anthony Newley, anything from the 60s, you're going to hear the voice that Bowie was using back then. Like any great artist, he starts out imitating his influences until he kind of, you know, they coalesce into his own, his own special voice. But um, that's good. There are two songs on here that I love. Uh, Let Me Sleep Beside You, which is a good song, but In the Heat of the Morning is my favorite early Bowie song. The organ on it is amazing. It points to uh, the talent that was going to, to bloom later on. Um, but there's also a song on here, We Are Hungry Men. 
in which Bowie manages to uh, fit both Nazis and abortion into it. So uh, it may not surprise you that Derham dropped David Bowie. That's right, the label dropped David Bowie. And the reason is because he couldn't write a hit. So what does David Bowie do? 1968, gets dropped by Derham. What does he do? He writes a hit. Uh, this is the 1972 cover of this album, which is my favorite cover of it, which is why I'm showing it. But it came out you know, in 68. Uh, Space Oddity is this, the big single that took over the world. It was a big hit. Um, the full-length album is produced by Tony Visconti. He didn't produce Space Oddity, though, because he said it was a novelty record, and he didn't do novelty records. Um, and then it took over the, you know, all of England, and he was like, no, fuck. But this whole album is good. Um, it's got things like Unwashed and Somewhat Slightly Dazed, which has a great Dylan influence. Um, Letter to Hermione, which is for... Um, Hermione Farthingale, I believe her name was, uh, a girlfriend, an ex-girlfriend, who dumped David Bowie. That's right. A girl dumped David Bowie, and a label dropped David Bowie. All you late bloomers out there, there's, there's life lessons in this, in this story. Um, but my favorite song on this is Memory of a Free Festival. It's a beautiful, nostalgic opening. He's remembering this free festival that he went to and he kissed a lot of people that day and it was you know outdoor and and uh lots of hippies and love and then by the end of the song you're at the festival and the sun machine is coming down and there's going to be a party after that he ends up on mercury records for the man who sold the world i'm showing you this cover because it's it's one of my favorites it's uh, also from 72 when, when uh, his Ziggy Stardust album uh, became popular. Um, all of his earlier albums got re-released with new covers. And I just like this because of the action in this shot, um, even though it doesn't fit with uh, the persona he was back then. Um, it really is a, a cool cover. Um, you may know it either by the Man Dress album cover or well, by Jingo, the cartoon cover of it. But um, this album is produced by Tony Visconti, who worked with Bowie several times. He also was a big producer for Mark Bowman and T-Rex. He did all of the great T-Rex albums. Um, of course, the lead song you might know from the Nirvana cover, if you don't know Bowie's. Um, and this one is a much more, this version of the song is a much more sultry, almost Latin-influenced kind of sexy man who sold the world. Um, and, and the alienation in the song really comes through, which, um, you know, uh, Cobain's cover was fantastic, but uh, this one uh, has another element to it altogether. And it's a bit of a, it's, it's a breed apart from a lot of other songs uh, made at the time or any time. The Width of a Circle was most people's introduction to the great Mick Ronson, a fantastic guitarist who would stay with Bowie uh, for a few more years. Um, he's on this, as well as the first uh, appearance of Woody Woodmansey, billed here as Mick Woodmansey. So the two Micks uh, are on here. He plays drums. Um, so two of the three Spiders from Mars are on this album. Um, Trevor Boulder, the bass player from the Spiders, did not arrive yet. Tony Visconti plays bass on this album, and he's really the unsung hero of this album. His melodic bass playing, is, it just elevates every song, um, and he really knew what he was doing. Uh, she Shook Me Cold is my favorite track on the album. It's very metallic. It's almost uh, Zeppelin-esque, if I may, and I did. Um, All the Mad Men uh, sounds like it was an outtake from Jesus Christ Superstar. There's really interesting music on here, but it's a bit of a schizophrenic album. It shows him firing in all directions at once, not quite sure who he wants to be, which is a refrain in Bowie's career. Um, but anyway, this is a great album. It would point the way for a lot of different directions he would later go. Um, he ends up getting signed by RCA, home of Elvis. Uh, they even share a birthday, I believe, Bowie and Elvis. 
Um, but Hunky Dory is a great record. It's a lot of Bowie fans' favorite records. It was mine for a while. Some very big songs are on here. Queen Bitch, uh, his ode to Lou Reed is on here. Um, Changes, of course, is a massive hit. Oh, You Pretty Things. So there are big, big songs on here. But songs like Quicksand are fantastic. Kooks is a wonderful song about uh, the birth of his son, Zoe Bowie, as he was named at the time. He goes by Duncan Jones now. Um, and he's a film director, I believe. Uh, but it was all about how, you know, he and his wife, Angela, were not your typical parents, uh, which I think everyone already knows. There's a song on here, Fill Your Heart, which is a Biff Rose song that uh, is in the music hall tradition. He covered it because he used to love Tiny Tim's rendition that he would hear when the two would play clubs together back in 67. Um, every time I hear it, I want to slam my head against the wall until I lose consciousness. Uh, but that said, uh, also the um, song for Bob Dylan, I think is about five years too late. Um, and Eight Line Poem uh, is not my favorite. Other than that, this, this album has unbelievable songs on it. It's, it's a truly great album, in spite of its flaws. Um, which brings us to Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, who are all here now on uh, guitar, drums, and bass. Um, it's a perfect record. It is a perfect example of glam rock. Uh, it rocks very hard, yet it still somehow is beautiful. Uh, Moon Age Daydream is a fantastic song that you need to hear. If you don't like that song, you don't like glam rock. Uh, my favorite song on this changes from time to time. Uh, for a while it was, it was uh, five years. Um, for a while it was, uh, you know, hang on to yourself. But I really love Star. I think it's an underrated gem of a song on this album. Uh, Starman was the big hit from this, the lead single. Um, it really took over the world. Uh, it blew Bowie up. Um, his management team of uh, Tony DeFries uh, was in place. He was about to, to form Main Man, his big production company. And um, Ziggy Stardust was the first persona that Bowie would inhabit. Uh, he's based on a few things. He's a mix of Vince Taylor who was uh, this British singer with brand new Cadillac, who uh, was called the French Elvis for a while because he was so popular over there. Um, and um, it was a mix of Vince Taylor and the Droogies from A Clockwork Orange, the film that Bowie loved. And um, the name itself, Ziggy Stardust, he took uh, Stardust from the um, uh, Stardust Cowboy, the uh, star out of Lubbock, the um, I'm blanking on his name, it's LSD, the Lonesome Stardust Cowboy, it's one of them, it's something like that. But um, anyway, this, this whole album is just, it's a burner. And uh, it's, it's, it's to be played at maximum volume, as it says on the back. Um, his next persona that he would inhabit is Aladdin Sane, still with the Ziggy hair, uh, but a bit of a, a, a different, more desperate character. Um, you see the lightning bolt that is on his face. That is from his makeup artist, Pierre LaRoche, who did that for this cover shoot. Um, you know, people sometimes, they like reducing Bowie to a lightning bolt. And they're like, hey, I'm David Bowie. And they have a bolt on their face. But uh, David Bowie never performed with the lightning bolt once. N not even once did he perform with that lot. Uh, it was strictly for the photo shoot. Um, and the hair from Ziggy Remains, that was uh, Kansai Yamamoto, who designed all of his uh, stage outfits for the Ziggy years. He, uh, he had a photo shoot with a model who had her hair cut in the Ziggy style, and it was bright red. And Bowie said, I love that. And so he got um, his hairstylist, Susie Fussy, to cut his hair in that manner. And uh, she later, by the way, went on to become Mick Ronson's assistant. And then later uh, she married Mick Ronson. Um, 
but anyway, the, the hair remains, uh, and it's such a great shot, very iconic. Um, this album is the first arrival of uh, Mike Garson, who was an avant-garde pianist, and his piano playing really uh, elevates the album and is kind of the secret ingredient to why it's so great. Um, he brings a lot to the table. He doesn't detract from the songs. Uh, sometimes he calls attention to himself, but in a really interesting way, as in the atonal parts of the Aladdin Sane song. Bowie just loved him. Mike Garson, by the way, played Bowie's first U.S. concert and his very last U.S. concert, and about a thousand concerts in between. He was Bowie's uh, most frequent onstage um, personnel. Uh, they played together for years. He just loved what he brought to the table. Uh, there are a lot of great songs on here. There's a cover of Let's Spend the Night Together that Bowie kind of has fun with and makes his own. Uh, the Gene Genie is fantastic. Um, this is a much louder, more raucous, crunchier, grittier album than Ziggy. Um, songs like Panic in Detroit, Crack Actor are just raunchy as they come. And uh, Watch That Man is a great song that kicks off the album uh, that talks about uh, Bowie's um, visit to New York where he met the New York Dolls and encountered uh, that scene for the first time. And also how scary that scene was when it interacted with you know, truck drivers and people outside of that scene. So anyway, that was a good album. Uh, which brings us to Pin Ups, um, which is Bowie's covers album. It's much maligned by a lot of fans and critics of Bowie, but um, I think it's a fun album. That's Twiggy, the supermodel, on the cover. This was a shot for Vogue magazine in France, and uh, Bowie convinced them to give it to him instead so that he could use it for his album. Um, it's got a lot of covers of bands that he loved back in the 60s when he was playing the clubs. Uh, Here Comes the Night by Them with Van Morrison, um, The Yardbirds, uh, Sid's Pink Floyd, the Pretty Things, the Mojos, a lot of good bands are on this. Uh, it's much maligned because people think he doesn't, you know, do a good job. But things like, he takes it down back alleys you really wouldn't if you're a different artist. Um, he turns the Who's I Can't Explain into a sexy dirge. Uh, and I think his sorrow is a big improvement over the other sorrow. Um, one more thing on pinups. There was supposed to be a pinups part two. This was aimed at the American market that maybe didn't know the original English songs, but there was going to be a, a pinups part two in which he did American songs for the British market. And he even recorded songs for it, like uh, Growing Up by Brick's, uh, Bruce Springsteen from the Asbury Park album. And um, that stayed unreleased until 1990, I believe. But um, Bowie's heart was very much in the covers album. It wasn't just a, a cash grab. Uh, which brings us to Diamond Dogs. The Ziggy Hair still remains for the last time. This is his Farewell to Glam album. Uh, he was already beginning his slow transition into soul music, uh, R&B music, all of the, the stuff that he fell in love with in the clubs in New York and Philly. Um, this is a dystopic nightmare set to music. Uh, the character he plays here, although he has elements of Ziggy and Aladdin Sane, is called uh, Halloween Jack. He's uh, part dog, part Bowie, all amazing. Uh, the big song off this is 1984, which is great. He performs it on the Dick Cavett show, um, uh, followed by a, a very cocaine sniffy interview, which is a very big... Uh, very big part of my my uh, viewing pleasure. Um, but my pick off this album, Sweet Thing, Candidate, and Sweet Thing, Reprise, uh, is just everything you need to know about Bowie during that time period. In fact, you can see some of the great footage of him performing that little suite of songs uh, on the tour, the Diamond Dogs tour. Um, which has been cleaned up now, and it looks amazing. Cracked Actor is a good DVD if you want to get it from that time period. Um, but just to show you how he was already transitioning 
Um, you can kind of hear it on 1984 that he was starting to get a little bit more into the R&B. By the end of the tour, it was just called the Philly Soul Tour. It was the Philly Dogs Tour and then the Soul Tour. Um, and it was uh, kind of the height of, of his descent into cocaine addiction. Um, you know, uh, that was a hard tour for him. He still produced some of the best shows of his career. Young Americans, uh, his transition into Plastic Soul, as he called it, or Blue Eyed Soul, is now complete. This is a beautiful album. It sounds great. Lush arrangements, pristine production. Um, the title track, Young Americans, is great. There's a few songs I want to call out, though. Win is a, a, an ethereal song, quite beautiful. Uh, Fascination uh, is co-written with Luther Vandross, who was a backing vocalist with him at this time. And he used to, he and Mick Gar uh, Mike Garrison and the rest of his band used to go out and open for Bowie on the Diamond Dog Store. And they would play some songs. And one of the songs that they played was one Luther Vandross wrote called Funky Music. And Bowie would hear this every night and he's like, oh, I love that song. And so he co-wrote this song, Fascination. He put great lyrics to it. And it's, it's a highlight of the album. My pick off this is the song called Right. That's my deep cut. I love it. It's a real groove. It's, it's repetitive and sexy and fun. And it shows you just how much he loved uh, the soulful music he was making at this time. Um, that is pretty much a, a perfect album. Which brings me to my favorite Bowie album, Station to Station. The arrival of the Thin White Duke, uh, another persona that Bowie put on um, and lost himself in, as he often did. Uh, it was an outgrowth of the character he played in The Man Who Fell to Earth, um, and there was something very alien-like about uh, his performances at this time. He was, he was uh, very isolated and very... Um, just kind of lost himself in his own psyche. Uh, he was holed up, writing new music. Um, he was uh, really in the, the nadir of his uh, cocaine addiction. Um, and he produced some of the best music of his career. Um, that, don't take that message. Don't try it. Don't do drugs. Um, Station to Station, the lead track, is just a train chugging along at you. It's, it's a phenomenal track. It's, it's impactful. He would open up concerts with it at this time. It, it had an intro that went anywhere from five minutes to 15. Um, Golden Years is the big hit off of this, which is a great song. Word on a Wing is a beautiful song. It's all about prayer. Bowie was searching for some sort of spiritual, uh, I don't know if reclamation is the right word, but some kind of, uh, you know, any help that he could get at the time. Um, TVC 15 is a fun song. And my pick is Stay. I love that song. It's, um, it's just beautiful. And it's one of his best vocal performances uh, on any Bowie song. And Wild is the Wind is a cover, which if you don't know Bowie, it'll maybe help you unlock his sound at this time a bit. It was originally by Johnny Mathis in, I think, 57 for a stage show. Um, it was later covered by Nina Simone, who has a, a really slowed down version of it, which is pretty amazing. Um, but then he decides to kick his cocaine addiction. So he, he packs up his, his uh, thin white suit and Iggy Pop and heads over to Berlin to begin the Berlin Trilogy. Three albums that he would make with Tony Visconti producing and his playmate, Brian Eno. Uh, Brian would join Bowie for the sessions. They would sometimes write together. More often than not, though, Eno would simply act as a, a prompter or a catalyst to get these sessions going, <clears throat> to help Bowie over writer's block, or to just come up with a great idea. He helped Bowie to fall in love with mistakes. He showed him new ways to record. He 
showed Bowie uh, crazy tricks, like, um, you know, taking a song that was already done, taking off the vocals and putting new vocals on, slowing it down, playing it backwards, having a guitarist play a lead when he can't hear the song. Um, but anyway, this song set in motion a uh, kind of paradigm he would use on his next few albums, which is side one has really quirky, angular, sugar candy pop songs, almost really hooky. Not, not for everybody. I didn't mean to imply that pretty avant-garde stuff still. But um, once you're into Bowie and you get up to this album, it's just what you want to hear. Uh, first side is, is hooky pop songs, and side two are sound experiments, which work or don't work. On this album, they work. They spin like a top. Anyway, uh, my favorite song on this always varies. Be My Wife is a great song. Um, it's, uh, it's got lyrics that are still done in a, a cut up style that he would employ on many albums throughout his career. But, um, it was just, it, it's something that has to be heard. I don't want to call out too many individual songs on this just because it's, it's a tremendous album that, that needs to be heard and taken in its entirety. He followed that up with Heroes. Um, this did, uh, very well because of the title track. Um, it was very well received. Um, you know, there's a, there's a song on this that I love called Sons of the Silent Age, which is just a gorgeous song um, and underplayed and underappreciated. That's the beautiful thing about Bowie. All of his albums, there are a few tracks that you could, you could hear and you're just like, why have I never heard this before? That is one of them. Um, so I highly recommend that. And The Secret Life of Arabia is a song that I like a lot, even though I don't think it should have ended the album. I think it should have been on side one with all the other uh, songs with lyrics because there would be something beautiful about ending this with uh, nothing but, but uh, instrumentals. But it's, it's another really good album. Uh, Eno and Brian Fripp, uh, Robert Fripp is on it, Brian Eno and uh, Carlos Alomar uh, plays great guitar on it. He would of course uh, be with Bowie for many years before and after. Um, that brings us to Lodger. Any way you put it, it works as an album cover. And this is a very, very underrated David Bowie album. I think it's due for a uh, reevaluation. There are a couple of songs on this that are really hooky and, and uh, real great pop songs. DJ, I am a DJ, I am what I play. I was a DJ for over 20 years. Trust me, this is a good album. Um, the, uh, the song Boys Keep Swinging is great. It's got a funny video with it as well. That proves that Bowie hadn't lost his sense of humor at all. Uh, I really think you need to check this out. Um, there's some songs, like I was talking about the experiments, uh, Red Money is a song on this that is exactly uh, Sister Midnight, the song he wrote with Carlos Alomar and Iggy Pop, except uh, they took those lyrics off and put on new ones. Uh, also, Fantastic Voyage is a song that I really love on this album. Brings us to uh, 1980. Um, this, uh, this pretty Bowie here with all the makeup uh, would make a fantastic video for the song Ashes to Ashes, which is on this. Um, after the, the trilogy, which, you know, critics had a lot of problems with, a lot of those albums, um, they feel he got the balance right on this album, what he was trying to do on the trilogy. Um, it's got experimental stuff, but it's, it never loses uh, listenability. Uh, songs like, um, you know, the, the title track and um, Ashes to Ashes and Fashion, they all work as, you know, regular songs. Um, but then there are things like uh, <laughs> Up the Hill Backwards. Uh, it's almost like you cut three different songs together. Um, but, you know, Bowie at this time, you know, this was his arrival saying, I'm going to be relevant in the 1980s. And uh, to it, the song, uh, my favorite song on this album, Teenage Wildlife, 
is Bowie's kind of sneer and snarky uh, message to all of the new wave kids who are out there trying to out Bowie Bowie in 1980. I'm looking at you, Gary Newman, who I love. Um, but anyway, this, this entire album is fantastic. Um, so that's it for the record albums. If you're curious about David's Bowie, uh, David Bowie's life, check out Strange Fascination Bowie, The Definitive Story by David Buckley. I've read many, many Bowie biographies. This is by far the best. It's very readable, yet it's got all the details you need. Um, if you're just curious about glam rock, if you like Bowie, you want to explore further, you're not sure which artists you want to get into, Shock and Awe, Glam Rock and Its Legacy by Simon Reynolds, a great author. I have his post-punk book, Rip It Up and Start Again. Um, this is a great book. It, it's got a lot on Bowie, and it also puts him in context with other artists of the time. It's got T-Rex, um, Roxy Music, New York Dolls, anything, anything you want to know. And finally, if you want any photos of this beautiful, beautiful man, Moon Age Daydream by Mick Rock, it's The Life and Times of Ziggy Stardust. It captures Bowie all through the Ziggy Stardust years. Uh, he's on stage, he's backstage, he's naked, he's half naked, he's doing all sorts of things he shouldn't. Uh, it's, it's just a beautiful tone by one of the best uh, rock photographers that there ever was. So please check out the description, see if there's anything in there you like because I'd love to turn people on to this great artist. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. I'll see you again soon. Please hit the like button, subscribe to me. Let's grow this channel together, and I will see you soon. Bye.